Hey gang, welcome to Time in the Market episode three. Today we're gonna to talk about my portfolio, do a quick update on that, and then do a deeper dive into one of the two portfolios that I primarily invest in on amount finance, that being the dividend aristocrats portfolio. I wanna give you an idea of why I think it's a good investment portfolio and talk about dividend growth investing in general as that's the sort of theory that drives that portfolio. Uh, so first of all, let's start with the quick portfolio update. That's going to be a small part of the portfolio. I mean, these are week weekly shows, so I'm not going to focus on the portfolios too much if I can help it, unless something major changes. I'm not investing a ton of money, so week over week changes aren't going to be that huge. Uh, first, we'll start with the industry investments portfolio week over week. I'm up about a percent there. Uh, the market's doing well today. Uh, December 6th so some of the early losses that I took earlier in the week have been erased and and replaced by gains and I also contributed a tiny bit of money maybe like a hundred dollars this week into this portfolio as you can see the various slices here the sports teams and pets and animals slices are doing well pretty much everything is up in the green this week so so that's good the portfolio is still pretty small 11.4k but it's certainly growing if you look at it in the last year i started at 2500 i've really ramped up investing in the last couple of months i i was kind of slow at the beginning of the year but now that i have a little bit more money to invest beyond my tax advantaged accounts i'm, I'm putting it here um and it's going to be nice to see this portfolio grow a bit more again this series is mainly focused on my m1 finance portfolios that are my sort of fun taxable account portfolios and not on my boring 401k portfolios i think it's good to have a mix of both you know most people should really take advantage to take advantage of their tax advantaged accounts like their 401ks their iras and invest as much as they can there before moving into taxable accounts because the tax advantage benefits are just huge but certainly investing in taxable accounts is a bit more interesting which is why i'm focusing this series on these accounts and talking about the stocks in them because it's just it's just more fun to do it for me and it's probably more fun for you guys to watch it so the industry investments portfolio is up quite a bit year over year uh, in the last week we're up about a percent most of that is from market gains a little bit of that is from the dividends if we look at the activities that I've, i had one buy a couple of days ago and then a couple of dividends here and there from Intel, Booz Allen, Hamilton Holding Corporation, Zotis, and Visa paying me a bit every other day here. Uh, it's always nice to see the, these dividends roll in. Again, I'm, I'm a long-term investor, so I'm, I'm buying these stocks and holding them for an extended period of time, and all of these dividends are going to be reinvested when possible. What M1 Finance does in, is when this cash holding amount goes up to above 10 bucks, it deposits that money into the stocks that i have selected based on the um allocation i have selected so you know once i get dividends where my cash total gets up to ten dollars m1 finance will initiate a buy and kind of buy the stocks that are underweight according to my allocations which is what i like about it you know i can buy 50 or 60 stocks without a ton of capital and kind of have it auto allocated for me every deposit i make usually it's something relatively small it gets deposited in the same area you know what whatever is under allocated gets gets topped up whatever's over allocated doesn't get touched and 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 things kind of move up and down as they go and money goes into the areas that are underpriced in relation to the other securities so the industry investments doing pretty well uh in the last week we'll move on to dividend aristocrats which is the the portfolio that i'm going to be talking about more today we're we're barely above flat for the week um, you know, again, not not a huge change. This 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 portfolio is more dividend focused, so we're, we're sitting at five bucks in dividends for the week. Again, none of these numbers are huge um, in terms of the dividends I'm getting in either portfolio, and that's because these portfolios are very small, right? If we're looking at dividends of eighty four cents, thirty six cents, the Visa one was like a dollar. It, it's not it's not a lot of money that is being paid out by these stocks but it's also not a lot of money that i have invested and the idea is that if i keep investing into the the stock market using m1 finance or any other brokerage firm keep the dividends that i'm getting and reinvest them into the same securities in the long run the compound growth of that investment strategy will pay dividends not just in the form of dividends but also in the form of capital gains 
and everything else that comes with investing in stocks. So it's a way to build wealth across a long period of time. And that's why I invest. And that's why you guys should be investing as well. Um, it doesn't take a lot to start. And it also doesn't seem like it's doing much initially, right? In the last week, I gained 50 bucks and gained $4 in dividends and you know $2 in the other portfolio on my $20,000 in investments. But those numbers will creep up, right? The part of the journey is kind of seeing those numbers grow. And I think that's what I'm trying to illustrate with these series of videos in the long run. You know, we're starting here with dividends that are 36 cents. Hopefully a couple of years from now, we're going to be talking about dividends daily dividends that put us above that ten dollar mark where things are going to be where i'm going to get automatic buys pretty much every other day because i'm getting dividends here and there and everywhere that are above ten dollars and i'm buying stocks with those dividends right away so not quite there yet but eventually we will be and that's kind of the idea behind investing it's really the idea behind dividend growth and investing and that's what i want to focus about in today's videos and i want to talk more about the dividend aristocrats portfolio so as far as the updates go, I kind of covered each individual portfolio right there. We're going to look at the totals in this spreadsheet I've made here. So week over week, the last update was slightly more than a week ago because I made it before Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, by the way. Happy holidays. Hope your Thanksgiving went very well. We were up 900 bucks week over week then. This week, it's, it's a bit smaller because I didn't put as much money into the stock market as I did in the past in the past update we're still up about 213 dollars week over week up to a new total of 20.5k uh, the forward income which is, i know people like to see is, is how much dividends this portfolio will produce on an annual basis going forward that should be going up as well you know we went up about four bucks this week from 314 to 318 dollars so it's it's not a huge super high yielding portfolio that i have here my industry bets portfolio yields less than a percent because it's focused on growth stocks the dividend aristocrats portfolio is, is somewhere in the 2.5 percent range because it's more dividend growth stocks sometimes those are lower yielding stocks in the beginning but they'll grow as the years progress so overall the yield isn't that high but it still produces quite a bit of forward income for me you know an investment of twenty thousand dollars isn't a lot but to get about 318 dollars from passive income each and every year and that passive income is going to grow as i invest more and also as the companies that i own raise their dividends that's that's great to see um, so right now i'm sitting at about 20.5k i don't you know i don't really have any set goals with this portfolio but it's nice to see it go up and up and up and i think that's the that's the real goal right eventually this is going to hit 100k eventually it's going to hit 200k and so on and so forth the first couple of years of investing are definitely the hardest before the compound growth takes it takes its takes over you're still really dependent on the contributions you make the growth doesn't seem like it's it's that high but if you just wait with it in in the long run it'll pay off so i talked about it in my last video so so revisit that if you want to know why investing makes sense um, what compound growth is and, and stuff like that. I don't want to revisit it. That That's out there uh, in episode two. So what I want to do today is kind of talk about the dividend aristocrats portfolio. You know, I mentioned it before, but now I really want to dive into it and, and get started on, on talking about what that portfolio is and what the strategy behind it is. And it, really, it, it's relatively simple. The dividend aristocrats portfolio is something that tracks the s p 500 dividend aristocrats index and th this index was launched by standard poors in in may 2015 you can kind of see that here and the idea behind it is that it, it includes companies that have paid and grown their dividends for 25 plus years and are also in the s p 500 so these are large cap companies most of them are are three billion plus in market capitalization and they have been consistent performers in terms of their financials which has allowed them to share some of their profit uh, with the owners of the stock uh, on a consistent basis so it's it's not an easy task to pay dividends consistently for 25 years but these companies are the ones that have done it and they continue to do it and that's why they are in this index. And the idea behind the index and why people are interested in investing in it is that it has historically outperformed the S&P 500 with uh, lower volatility, 
if you look at longer investment timeframes. And I'll talk about why that is in a bit and kind of look at the various historical returns of the two indexes, the S&P 500 and the Dividend Aristocrats Index. But at first, I want to focus on the holdings within the index. And currently, the index holds about 57 companies. And when I say about, I mean exactly 57 companies. And these companies are the the 57 out of 500 companies in the S&P 500 that have met the criteria of the dividend aristocrat name, right? And realistically, the, the main criteria is that you have to have paid dividends for 25 years. And not only that, but also raised dividends for 25 years. So there's a lot of companies in here. I have them all listed on this spreadsheet that you can look at while you watch the video. I'm not going to name them all, but I'll scroll down really quickly over here. You can probably see a lot of companies that you recognize and know pretty well. You have to think about what it means to be a dividend payer slash raiser for 25 years. And it essentially means that you have to be somebody who's good at what they do, right? It's it's not an everyday company that raises their profits in a way that they can share them with their um, with their stockholders for 25 years in a row. And some of these companies have, have raised their dividends for 30, 40, 50 years in a row, right? It's not 25 years and that's it, it's 25 plus. So there's a lot of companies in here that have been around for decades that have raised their dividends for decades. And that's a good thing, right? It shows that the business can, can kind of function through thick and thin. It can not only raise dividends during good times, but also raise dividends during bad times. You know, there's the 2008 recession um was kind of a big deal for a lot of businesses and a lot of businesses even ones that were previously in the aristocrat index cut their dividends but these 57 did not they managed to get through the last three or four recessions without any hit to their dividends and not only that but they've also raised the dividends through that time period which is which is an impressive thing to do and that's the idea behind the, the investing thesis behind uh, the Dividends Aristocrat Index is that you're essentially buying companies that are good performance historically and have the financial wherewithal to weather storms such as recessions and, and things that may impact a business negatively and do it in a way that allows them to continue sharing their profits with shareholders. And People like that, right? People like the the stability that comes with a business like that. And in return, people like holding on to these stocks. And in return, people buy them when things are bad because they feel like they might be um, relatively safe havens in a world that looks unsafe when things get kind of murky in the stock market. And as a result, these stocks have done fairly well, fa fairly well historically in relation to other things, you know, in relation to, to more volatile stocks that may be out there. And, and again, you can kind of see what companies are represented here. Um, you know, AT&T, big name that you're probably familiar with, Caterpillar, Chevron, the Clark company, Coca-Cola, um, Colgate and Palmolive, ExxonMobil, Hormel, Johnson & Johnson. I'm not gonna name them all. McDonald's is another one. Again, companies that have been around for a while, that have paid dividends for a while, that have had good returns, um, and uh, have essentially grown their dividends because that's the that's the the main core of this investment thesis, right? You want companies that are growing their dividends and continuing to grow their dividends into the future because the the idea behind dividend growth investing is a powerful one. Let me let me give you an example of what I mean by that because the reason people like dividend growth stocks is because they can kind of see what's going to happen in the future more readily than they would with any other stock, right? Um, dividends are are things that are relatively predictable in the mind of an investor, right? It, it's something you can depend on and it's income that you know can be there when you need it. Obviously, they're not guaranteed. Companies do cut their dividends, but companies also lose share price, right? So a lot of people see dividends as a way to kind of mitigate the loss in share price because you're still going to get some sort of payment and on top of that, a lot of people depend on the payment as a way to generate passive income, right? So if you have a company that's giving you a dividend every couple of months, you don't really care about their share price as much as you would if a company is not paying you anything because you're sort of looking at that income more so than you're looking at the price. 
And both of those matter, the income and the price matters. But dividends kind of have a way of stabilizing the investment mentality for some investors and helping them not focus on the price as much. And that's kind of important in the long run because people have a tendency to kind of panic when things go awry. And if you have a stock that pays dividends, that continues to pay dividends even though their price drops, and then you know it helps you not to sell that stock, that's a win in my book because really the idea behind investing is to whether is, is to invest whether the times are good or bad you know you, if you panic and sell at the wrong time you're probably not going to do as well as an investor who buys and holds for as long as possible and sells when things are good you, you rarely want to sell when things are bad when it comes to investing in a big index obviously if you're just investing in one stock things can go awry really quickly and you might have to sell at a bad time because it will never recover but when you're investing in a in a basket of stocks an s p 500 index or something like this where it's 57 different stocks it's highly unlikely that all 57 different stocks are going to completely go out of business or all 500 stocks in the s p 500 are going to go completely out of business because if they do then things are really wrong with the economy and you know it's the least of your worries that your stocks are going out of business so this is why dividends work right if you're if you if in year one you buy a thousand dollars worth of stocks that yield 2.5 percent and that's not a huge yield but it's it's enough um, that means you're essentially buying a yield of 2.5%, like I mentioned, that's, that's what yield is. It's how much income is generated in relation to the capital invested. So a 2.5% yield on a thousand dollars will mean $25 in annual income. You know where you're starting, right? You're starting with a $25 passive income portfolio and you hope that it will, it will grow. What's great about the dividend aristocrats and dividend growth stocks in general is that year over year, these companies that were initially yielding 2.5%, which means they give you a $25 payout on an annual basis, will grow their dividend even ir 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 and, uh, and that's irrelevant to their price, right? So you're really only concerned about the dividend growth in this scenario. And the S&P 500 dividend aristocrat index in the last five years, I believe, has grown their dividend by about 9% on average. Some of these companies grow their dividends at a much lower clip. Some of them are like 2% a year bumps. Some of them grow them at a much higher clip. Some of them are growing their dividends at a 20% a year bump in the last couple of years, which is great. So on average, they've grown their, their yield at a 9% clip. So by year two, even if you put no additional money in here, the, the fact that these companies are raising dividends has bumped you up to $27.25 in annual income. So now your yield is 2.75. And if they continue raising their dividends and you have a long-term investment horizon, you can make a lot of passive income off of a relatively small initial investment, right? So essentially what happens is the yield on cost, which is how much you paid for the stock versus how much it's yielding right now, increases as the dividend growth stocks increase their dividends. So let's assume that these stocks are going to continue raising their dividends for an extended period of time at a clip of 9% per year. And that's a hefty assumption. It may not happen at a, such a high level, but this is just an example. Let's say they do it for 30 years. By the time you're 30 years away from your initial investment, your yield on cost, how much passive income you're generating on that initial investment is 30.4%. And that's why dividend growth investing works, right? Because you are getting a lot of passive income generation in the long run from a, a relatively small initial cost. But the reality of this investment strategy is that it has to be a long-term committed strategy, right? It, it works in the short term as well, right? By year 10, or, or even by year five, your yield on cost is already much higher than the 2.5, it's 3.5%, right? But it's still far above the 30% that you're gonna get by year 30. And if you have a longer term horizon, let's say you're, you're a 40 year investor here, whoops. The yield on cost gets even crazier, right? And this is, this is the concept, this is similar to the concept of of compound growth that I talked about in the last video, right? If you've got a 9% a growth here for 40 years, you're talking about a 72% yield on cost, right? So now your $1,000 initial investment is suddenly yielding 
72% in the yield on cost is 72%. And again, 9% across 40 years is a very, very generous assumption. The reality is you're probably going to get something closer to like four or five across such a long period of time, probably even lower. But even if with, with a 4% increase, right, you're getting a, a yield on cost of 7.8% after 30 years, 11.5% across after 40 years. And that's pretty impressive. Um, it's It's very hard to find anything that yields such a high amount. And that's why people like div dividend growth investing. It it it, it kind of gives you a quantifiable passive income that you can depend on in the long run and that will grow in the long run. And that's partially the concept you find behind investing as a whole. When I talked about compound growth last episode, right? It's not just the growth that comes with the stocks. It's also the dividends that you're getting. So whether it's dividend growth investing or just investing in a, an index fund in general, right? You're going you're gonna to have a combination of the two. This strategy is more focused on the dividend growth aspect of things versus the 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 price appreciation aspect of things, and the other strategy is the reverse. You you focus more on price appreciation versus dividend growth. Um, both are valid strategies. Both work depending on what your preference is. You know, you can invest in a in an S and P five hundred index fund, get a total growth of X percent, or you can invest in a D dividend aristocrats index fund, get at total growth of y percent right and and they're just doing different things to get there the s p 500 still pays a dividend it still grows its dividend but it pays a lower dividend potentially than a dividend growth strategy and the growth on the dividend is also lower potentially than a dividend growth strategy right so those are still two different ways to sort of get to the same endpoint. some people prefer one or the other but this this strategy, the dividend aristocrat index strategy that I use in my M1 finance portfolio, is more on the dividend growth side than the total growth side. Obviously, I'm still gonna assume that I'm gonna have price appreciation. You know, if my dividends grow at four percent for forty years, but the stock price is exactly the same, my results are not gonna be great. You know, I need both for it to work. I either need the dividend growth to be super high, or I need the dividend growth to be reasonable, like a four percent increase. And then the price appreciation to kind of make up the rest of the 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 growth that I'm seeking, which is somewhere in the seven to ten percent range in the long run. So that's just an example of dividend growth and why it works. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but it is a it is a powerful powerful driving force behind investing, and it's a powerful mental force as well. People love dividends for that simple reason that hey, I'm getting a, a you know a a, a a paycheck of sorts every couple of days from a different company, right? And that paycheck, the more I invest in it and the more the company raises their dividend is gonna be bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, 20 years down the line, those paychecks from the 57 companies, 57 companies that I own in this aristocrat index are gonna be quite a bit of passive income because they're gonna grow their dividends. I'm gonna put more money into them. I'm gonna reinvest those dividends. And hey, I'm maybe making $4 a week right now in this portfolio, but you know, 20 years down the line, maybe I'm making a thousand dollars a week or something like that, right? The the power of compounding is powerful. The the amount of money you put into the market is obviously going to drive how much you're making and how these companies do is going to drive how much you're making. But historically these companies have done well and hopefully they'll continue to do well. And it's just one strategy to kind of look at. And and it's one I like because it's it's done well and it's um it's been a real good performer and it it it, it it's simple, right? It sort of shows you what to focus on and you're focusing on companies that grow their dividends and that's it. it. It takes kind of the thinking out of the investment process because a lot of people will ask, and I already had a question, and thank you for asking that question. It was a great question. Which which of these 57 companies do you like best? And there are companies that I like more than others. I've looked at the financial of most of these companies and I've said, hey, this one looks like it's, man, I don't know about this one and I really like that one. But the reality is that I I not that amazing at picking individual stocks and nobody really is that's why 80 percent of investment professionals fail to beat the market um, after fees so fees also play a role in that but it's also the fact that it's hard to just pick the winners you know if if i look at some of these companies when i was setting up this portfolio a year ago i looked at a company like target and i was like you know i don't really like target that much as a company i, I never really go into their stores retail is kind of dying in my mind um, yeah, I don't really want to buy it, but it is part of the portfolio, so I'll throw it in there. And if you go back to the portfolio, hopefully it's still up, it's not. But if you go back 
Sorry about that. If you go back to the portfolio, Target's been like my number one winner. It's it's up something ridiculous, like like fifty percent in the last year, because you know people were completely out on retail, and retail is actually not that bad. It seems um, things they're they're doing well, they're doing things well, and and there's a lot of other examples like that where I thought a company was going to be great and it's not, where I thought a company was going to be mediocre and it's great. And the beauty about this portfolio is that it kind of takes that analytical aspect out of it for you it says hey these companies have done something that's special that not a lot of companies have done they've raised their dividends for 25 years in a row or more and that's pretty impressive so i'm just going to invest in all of them i don't know which ones are going to be winners some of them are going to be winners some of them are going to be losers every other year it might change but in the long run these companies are going to do well and that's the thesis behind it and that's what you're doing and this is an interesting approach and it's similar to the the approach of investing just in the s p 500 right it's hard to pick the winners it's hard to pick the losers i'm going to invest in the entire stock market so oh, the question is why don't i just do that right why don't i just invest in the s p 500 and forget about this, this gimmick that i'm that i'm doing here and, and there's a couple of reasons for that and i'll talk about that in a second but first i want to talk about the index and whether or not it's static right so right now we have 57 stocks in here does this mean that this is all I'm ever going to invest in? These are the 57 companies that are in the index. I'm never going to invest in anything else. And the answer to that is no. The index changes. It changes for two reasons. One of those reasons is a company does not raise their dividend or cuts their dividend, right? And if a company cuts their dividend, they are automatically out of the index. So if tomorrow T. Rowe Price or, or Target said, hey, our dividend is a dollar, we're cutting it 20%. It's out, of, it's out of the portfolio. I'm removing it ASAP because I don't want companies that are not s sound enough to, to pay their dividends 25 years in a row anymore, right? They're essentially not a dividend aristocrat anymore. They, don't, they do not belong in this portfolio. Um, and also, if a company just simply doesn't raise their dividend, they keep it the same for a, a, a one-year period, that, that also means they fall out of the index. They, they do not qualify as a dividend aristocrat because they have not raised their dividends for 25 years in a row anymore right they kept it static and also companies may be added to the index right now there's a couple of companies in the s p 500 that have paid their dividends 24 years in a row so next year and usually what happens is in january i'll do a analysis of what stocks are added um, and then i'll add them to the portfolio so i, I know realty companies o ticker o is a, a dividend company that a lot of people like that have that they pay dividends monthly they've raised their dividend 24 years in a row so next year they're probably going to be added to the dividend aristocrat index ross stores is another one um it's a it's a retail company they've raised their dividend 24 years in a row i believe they've raised it this year as well so that means that'd be 25 years in a row now so they're going to be added i'm sure there's other companies that are you know 23 years 22 years 21 years um that have paid their dividends for that many years so that means you know two years from now there, there'll be more companies added so when when was the last time that companies have cut their dividends and how how often does that happen so i kind of have a list here of of the changes that have transpired in the portfolio through the last couple of years and really what happens is anytime there's sort of a crisis <laughs> companies have a tendency to to cut their dividends so during the 2008 2009 2010 banking crisis there were a couple of sizable dropouts from from the the dividend aristocrat index so the the moment these guys cut their dividends they they were removed in in 2009 the list was at 52 companies going into the year so starting in 2008 and then suddenly the the banking crisis hit and a bunch of these companies could not raise their dividend anymore could, or simply cut it to save money because things were were not looking great um, so the, the list declined from 52 companies to 43 in 2009. You know, companies like Anheuser-Busch, Bank of America, Key Corp, Progressive Corp cut their dividends. There were still additions in 2009, but there were only two. So you lost nine companies and gained two. In 2010, another 10 companies, uh, General Electric for one, Pfizer another, cut their dividends, right? So those, those guys are gone. Um, so then you added another company as well in 2010. So between 2009 and 2010, you added three companies, you removed 19. So there's a lot of fluctuation in, in the index when things are, are looking iffy. And that may seem troublesome, and, and it is. 
but it, it all depends on how that impacts long-term returns. And I'll talk about that in a second, but it, it really didn't, right? Because what you're doing is you're saying, hey, these companies are no longer cut out to be a dividend aristocrat, their financials are kind of murky, and, and potentially you're selling them at the right time. Because if they're cutting their dividend, sure, the price is going to drop, but maybe the long-term um, developments are not good for the company and their long-term returns are not going to be good, right? You're, you're focused on companies here that are going to continue raising their dividends into the the long future, the long-term future. And, and these companies obviously weren't able to do that, and they were removed. And then again, as years progressed, more companies were added, some companies were removed. You got three ad three additions in 2011, one removal in 2012, nine additions in 2012, another removal in 2013, another removal in 2014, another removal of 2015. Also, those two removals, two removals in 2015 were, were simply because um, the companies were sold. So you know you no longer had the company. And that happens sometimes as well, right? If a company is acquired, um, they, they'll no longer be in the in the index because you just can't own the stock anymore. Or if the company is removed from the S and P five hundred, it doesn't meet the qualification of being an S and P five hundred company, and it's removed from the index. So some addition, some removal. But in general, you know, aside from two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten, which were kind of once in a hundred year type <laughs> events where things were really not doing well. The, there's more additions than removals, right? There's quite a bit in 2012. There's a couple of removals here, but most of them are, are for reasons that are outside of financial reasons. If a company is acquired or if a company is removed from the S&P 500, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad company. They're just removed for reasons other than that. So that's the portfolio. Those are the the changes that may exist in the portfolio. So it is kind of ever changing, right? It's not going to be static all the time. I, I right now it's it's relatively static. You know, you've got fifty seven companies, probably a couple will be added next year. Maybe some will be removed. I, I don't think I, I look at it I've looked at any of these companies and said, oh, this one's at risk to cut their dividend, but you never really know. And again, if a company cuts their dividends or, or doesn't raise it, they'll be removed from my portfolio and I'll update that in the portfolio that I have and have shared with you guys. If companies are added, they'll be added to the portfolio. As of January, whenever the index is um, recalibrated and when those companies are announced, but in essence, this is the portfolio. This is the the backdrop of what this portfolio is about. It's about dividend growth. It's about companies that are raising their dividends and continue to raise their dividends. And it's about investing in financially sound companies and hoping that they outperform the S and P five hundred. So, what's different about the dividend aristocrats versus the S and P five hundred? And you can kind of see the different. Um, industries that the S&P 500 is made out of and a couple of things stand out right the the dividend aristocrat companies are essentially companies that have been around for quite a bit of time think about what raising your dividend for 25 years means 25 years or more it means you've had to be around since at least what is it 1994 i guess right so if your company was formed in 1990 is that right yeah 1994 and immediately paid a dividend and started raising it every year, then you'd be a dividend aristocrat, right? The, the, the emergence of the internet was just starting in the 90s and a lot of companies that you know, are, are big today in the information technology or the communications sphere probably haven't been around for 25 years. Some of them have, but a lot of them haven't, right? So that's why you're kind of looking at the dividend aristocrats and seeing this obvious gap. You know, the, there isn't a ton of representation in the information technology space and there isn't a ton of representation in the communication space and a lot of people say that's a bad thing and it, it very well could be right because in the long run the future performance of the index or anything you're investing in is dependent on what you hold in that index right and right now the dividend aristocrats do not hold a lot of information technology stocks or communication stocks in relation to the overall market and they're also very overweight in the consumer staples area which is you know dividend direct to consumer products such as food etc retail supermarkets yada 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 and the industrials so some people look at this and say this is a negative and, and it's certainly a risk when it comes to the dividend aristocrats and their future performance because 
the internet is the future and you're not really holding a lot of those companies within this index. And that's kind of why I have two different portfolios in this investing strategy. I have this dividend aristocrats portfolio, which, which includes a lot of these stalwart names that have done well in the past and, and, and continue to do well now, but maybe have some question marks in the future. Again, I, I don't know. They may outperform information technology stocks in the future. You never know. That's the beauty about investing. Things happen that you might not expect a lot of times. But also, in case they don't, I have this industry bets portfolio, which is more focused on those growth stocks, those internet stocks, those communication stocks like Google, Facebook, etc., that may not be as well represented as they should be or could be, should is a weird word to use, in the dividend aristocrats portfolio. So that's certainly a knock that some people use against investing in, in some of these older dividend yielding dividend growth companies and that you're investing in technologies and industries that are sort of going out of favor that doesn't mean they will perform poorly but some people have that that idea that hey consumer staples they're old they're being replaced by amazon brand they're being replaced by store brands trader joe's all these you know who goes to walmart anymore who goes to target anymore you can get everything online. You can, you know, who buys Hormel products? You just buy store brands. Who goes to McDonald's? You know, there's healthy foods now. Who uses, I don't know, Colgate Palmolive or who drinks Coca-Cola? There's different brands. Whether or not those ideas have any merit, it's really up to you to decide as an investor. I don't think so. I think certain consumer staple companies are probably going to have a harder time doing as well as they have in the past. Certain ones will do well because they have a, a very great moat and a, a very good brand name. But it, it's all it's all up in the air, right? I, I don't think a lot of these companies are going anywhere. I think they'll they'll continue to do well. It's just a matter of of deciding whether or not you feel like they're going to do as well as they have in the past or if they're going to do poor. Because the reality is that the returns of the dividend aristocrats, and this is a very important point, have been very, very good since the index was created, and also very, very good since the data, uh, since tracking them has started. And this includes all of the additions and removals that we talked about. Since 1991, when that was the first year I could get the data for the dividend aristocrats index, the average return of the S&P 500 has been 11.26%, and the average return of the dividend aristocrats have been 12.72%. And, and I don't want to focus too much about average on average returns because average returns are very misleading. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. Because average returns, whenever, whenever somebody talks about average returns, I would just say, what's the compound return? That should be a question. Because average returns don't really mean a ton. Average returns don't really mean a ton, right? They, they are sort of nonsensical because they don't actually look at the series that, of gains and losses that you're, you're, you're accruing. So I'll give you an example of what that means. You know, If I invest $1,000 and I lose 50%, then I gain 100%, then I lose 50%, then I gain 100%, then I lose 50%, my average return is 10%, right? But so what? <laughs> what does that mean? My average return is 10%, but it doesn't mean anything, right? Because I've actually lost money. So I can tell you that my average return is 10% and you'll say, wow, that seems pretty good. But in this scenario, I invested $1,000 and I've ended up at $500. So my average return was 10%, but my actual compound return was negative 13%. And the compound return is what you want to focus on every time with investing because it's the cumulative effect that a series of gains or losses has on an original amount of capital over a period of time. And that's what matters. It's the cumulative effect. It's not the average. It's the cumulative effect of, of your gains and losses. So when we look at the compound return of the S&P 500, it's 9.76%. And if we look at the compound return of the dividend aristocrats index, the 57 stocks that I talked about, and historically the various additions and changes, it's 11.8%. That's pretty big. That's a 2.03% difference in, um, in compound return. And you know, you say 2%, that doesn't sound like a lot. It's a lot, right? If we look at growth rates, 
it adds up. So uh, uh, let's start with the S&P 500. We've got a person who's investing $1,000 every year at the 9.8% annual compound return that the S&P 500 gives you. If you do that for 35 years, you know, you end up at $281,000. Pretty good. Not complaining. Nobody's complaining about that. If you invest, you know, a cumulative amount of 35k and you end up with 283,000, not bad. That's a win. That's a win in my book. But if you look at what the S and what the dividend aristocrat stocks have done in that same time frame, the 11.8%, you take that same investment philosophy, 35,000 overall for 35 years at 1,000 a year, you end up with 459K. Right? That's a big difference. That's like a, that's not quite double, but you know, it's, it's 63% more. So the 2% annual compound return makes a big difference. And that's why people really like the dividend aristocrats of the strategy, because historically the, the, the difference in return has been really good. And the reason for that difference is because when things are bad in the S&P 500, they get relatively bad, right? In 2008, the returns were at negative 37%. But they're less bad, and the volatility is quite a bit better in the, in the dividend aristocrats because it comes back to something I talked about earlier, right? There are people who really like the, the idea of, of safe, havens right and and really the dividend aristocrats are seen more as a safe haven than something like the s p 500 or definitely more as, of a safe haven than something like a nasdaq or anything that really focuses on technology stocks right so technology stocks are volatile often because they're aggressively priced they're growth stocks the stock market prices them aggressively and some of these dividend aristocrat stocks are kind of old school stocks the market prices them less aggressively so when things kind of get bad and people still want their money invested somewhere. Obviously, they can all ship to bonds, but some people kind of say, hey, I, I think there's still upside in stocks, but I want a, a bigger margin of safety, so I'll move my money to these stocks that kind of have, have weathered these storms in the past because these guys have paid dividends for 25 years in a row or more. So when, when bad times happen, as they happened in 2000, 2001, 2002, and 2008, stocks crash, and the dividend aristocrats still crash, don't get me wrong, but they crash in a much more reasonable way, right? So when the, the S&P 500 was down 37% in, in 2008, the dividend aristocrats were only down 22%. You know, it's still down quite a bit, but that's quite a, a lot less vol volatility. Now, the trade-off is that when things are going really well, Sometimes the dividend aristocrats do worse, right? So in the in the build up to the 2008 crash, the S&P 500 had a couple of years, and you know, in 2007 was one of those years when kind of these stocks were like, eh, you know, things are going up. Uh, I'm not going to invest in these old school stocks that are kind of out of favor. I'm going to invest in other stuff that's grown and and hot. So so they kind of underperform when things are great, but they really overperform when things are bad, which is why a lot of people like these stocks and why the long-term return is actually better. Because these, these guys, these you know, S&P 500 high-flying stocks, and if you look at the NASDAQ, the, the performance is even higher. You know, they do well when things are great, but when things are bad, they do a lot worse, right? So it, look at 95 up to 99. This is like really the, the tech bubble here where tech stocks were really exploding. And since the S&P 500 had a bunch of tech stocks and the dividend aristocrats really didn't, these 28% returns really eclipsed the 16% return in, in, in 98. So the S&P 500 looked amazing. The dividend aristocrats looked really crappy in 99, 21% versus a negative return. So it's like, why am I even investing in this? Well, you're investing in this because when things crash, when, when the S&P 500 goes negative 9, negative 11, negative 22, because it has a lot of exposure to tech or whatever industry happens to be hot at the time, or whatever growth stocks are in there, the dividend aristocrats, the, these companies are kind of, you know, they're kind of old school. They're kind of chugging along. They're still paying their dividends. They're not cutting them, even though these companies are cutting things left and right and profits are dropping. They're saying, hey, you know, people got to buy Coca-Cola. People got to go to Walmart. People have to buy meat. People have to buy these consumer staples. They, they do okay, right? And that's not to say that there's not negative returns here. There are some, but in, in the long term, the volatility is lower 
you know, when when stocks drop, they drop less with the dividend aristocrats, and the overall return is quite a bit higher. And a lot of that is because of that, right? It's it's a combination of hey, these stocks are seen as safer havens than some of these stocks, and the S and P five hundred is still a pretty safe haven in relation to some other things, right? We're not talking about very small indexes or holding 10 stocks or whatever we're talking about 500 stocks but it's still a pretty safe haven and the return is still pretty pretty good and and the volatility is still lower than than a lot of things but it's still higher than the dividend aristocrats and the return is still lower than the dividend aristocrats so when people say why don't you just invest in the s p 500 well it's because of this right these companies have proven through a period of time that's almost 30 years that they can they can return something pretty solid and that that's not even pretty solid it's very solid in relation to the s p 500 so it, the, the, these stocks have beaten the s p 500 by two percent and they've also done it in a way that makes me less likely to sell something because stocks aren't dropping 30 to 40 percent right they're still dropping but they're they're a lot less volatile and obviously past performance does not guarantee future returns some of the things i talked about here in that you know if technology is a big winner in the next 10 years you know the dividend aristocrats are clearly missing out on that boat at least right now you know some of these companies may be added in the future same with communications if industrials or consumer staples are big losers in the next 10 years again clearly materials as well is a big difference between the two clearly the the dividend aristocrats are not doing well if those those three are big losers but who knows <laughs> who knows if that's true right so it's a strategy that i think is worth exploring and i think it's a strategy that has valid points for it and those valid points for it are i think stronger than the valid points against it right because dividend growth investing is real i get why people like it and i like it as well for various reasons but I also like the idea of having a portfolio that takes the opinion out of it for me, right? I, I want to focus, if I want to focus on stock analysis, I'd prefer to focus on some of these industry bets that I'm making versus some of these old school aristocrat stocks because I just find that more fun. And that's not to say that I, I don't want to analyze this because I've still looked at most of these stocks and at, at least on a high level basis and, and made the decision that they're worth investing in. But also, you know, I've, I've got a strategy that has proven out across the years as being effective. And I've got a strategy that allows me to have a lower than average input into my investments than I would otherwise have to do if I invested in anything else, right? So if, if I can get something that can beat the S&P 500 consistently and be easy to invest in, I'd like to do it. And I think this is that type of strategy, right? I don't really have to pay too much attention to it. I say, hey, there's lists out there that give me the 57 stocks that are in there. I can create my portfolio off of that. Every January, there will be a release of, hey, here are the new stocks that are in there. Since these stocks are very closely followed, everybody kind of knows what the dividend aristocrats are. They're a big deal. Companies do not want to cut their dividends in, in fear that they'll lose their status. If anybody does, there'll definitely be news about it. So I don't have to like constantly track and check these companies every single day to make sure they haven't cut their dividend yet. Right? I'll know about it if it happens and I can remove it immediately from my portfolio. It's simple. It's a simple strategy. I like it. It allows me to invest in a lot of companies that are good, that have succeeded across many decades, across many different economic um, areas, um, and the returns that they've given across those years have been better than the S&P 500. So yes, I do invest in the S&P 500. Most of my 401k investments are in, in index funds like you know large cap S&P 500 funds or small cap funds. But sometimes you also want to have something that could potentially give you more of a return than the S&P 500. And this has the ability to do that. Obviously, there's no guarantee. Like I said before, past performance does not guarantee future returns. As I've said in other, in other episodes, I'm not a, a financial investment advisor. This is not 
any suggestion that you should invest in this portfolio. I own all of the stocks mentioned here, but you should talk to a, a qualified professional investor if you would like to um, make investments like this one before investing any money of your own. There is potential for losses. None of these numbers are guaranteed. The dividend aristocrats could just as well do completely poorly in the next decade and the S&P 500 could kill it or another strategy could kill it. That's the that's the interesting thing about investing, right? There's there's many ways to to the end result and this is just one of them. It just happens to be one strategy that I like. I think is interesting. I think is relatively easy to follow and I like it, right? That's all it comes down to. It's it's got a lot of of nice things about it. It's a combination of, you know, long-term investing with a with a little dash of dividend growth investing with a little dash of um, laziness thrown in because I don't really have to do a ton of research on these stocks. It's like, hey, you're a dividend aristocrat. Get in here, buddy. You're in my portfolio. Hey, you cut your dividend. Get out of here, buddy. You're out of my portfolio. Hey, you, you've hit the 25-year mark. Hey, get in here, buddy. You're a new addition. Um, and that's great. You know, the, the one negative thing about it is that ideally... I would like to have this portfolio in a uh, in a equally weighted um, allocation, which means if there's 57 stocks right now, you know, I would invest 1.75% into each stock. Unfortunately, M1 Finance doesn't allow you to do uh, you know like 1.75 as an allocation, so I have to make some choices around which stocks are two percent and which stocks are at one percent to equal to a hundred but that's the only negative with m1 finance m1 finance really is the best way to kind of invest in this strategy i could invest in an etf called noble which essentially nobl is an etf that replicates the same strategy they they reallocate every three months but the one thing about that is they charge a 35% expense ratio. So, you know, I, I could do this myself. And it's kind of fun to do it myself. And I can sort of have some say as to how that works. And it's free to me. And if I do it myself and get that return, it's a $459,000 return. If I just invest in Noble and I pay 35%. You know, 0.35 doesn't sound like a lot, but across 30 years, it's $37,000 $37, that I'm giving up to an ETF administrator. I'd rather just do it myself. You know, I find it enjoyable. If you don't find it enjoyable and you hate it, just buy NOBL if you want to follow the strategy. The ETF ticker is NOBL. I, you know, it's fine, but you are giving up potentially 37.5K in in returns when you do that so it, it's funny how 0.35 percent doesn't sound like a lot but thirty-seven thousand certainly sounds like a lot and again their strategy is slightly different than the one i'm following here because they they are equally weighted they have the ability to do that but um that's that's not really a big deal to me and they also rebalance every three months whereas i sort of just rebalance by putting new money into the stocks through m1 finance right so m1 finance will buy the ones that are underweight for me instead of having to rebalance every three months. And just like any other um, investment strategy, I will have to make changes to this every January. You know, if any new companies are added to the index, these 57 companies might become 62. I think there's five companies that are up for dividend aristocrat status this year. So 57 might become 62. If anybody gets removed, 57 might become 56. I'll remove the companies as soon as I hear about them. So it won't be like, let's wait until June to remove them. The day I hear about the dividend cut, they're out. And then if a company gets added, I will add them in January because that's kind of where the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrat Index makes the changes. So hopefully that was an interesting discussion for you. I kind of talked about you know, a lot of things, the Dividend Aristocrat Index, the 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 beauty of dividend growth investing and also you know why average returns don't matter and why you should focus on compound returns i always hate when people talk about average returns it's got an average return of x well that's great but you know an average return of 10% doesn't mean jack without the 
the background behind it. So it's really important to really focus on compound returns when you're looking at investments. And most of the time, that's what your, if you look at index funds or ETFs, they will give you the compound return. They're not giving you the average return because the average return can be very misleading. But oftentimes on like blog posts and stuff like that, I'll see an average return calculation. And it's like, well, okay, give me the compound return, please, sir or madam. Thank you. That's it for today. Um, let me know what you guys thought. I mean, know what you guys think about the dividend aristocrat strategy or dividend growth investing in general. And let me know if you have any additional comments or if you'd like to hear about a specific topic or a specific stock or anything like that. I will certainly be happy to walk you through it. Um, I'll try to make a video like this every week. Some weeks I may miss and, and some weeks I just might not have anything to talk about so I won't force it. But as always, thank you for watching.